Hey everyone, welcome to Dojo Talks. We have a really interesting episode today. Uh, we are going to be discussing uh, the topic of federation switching. So specifically when uh, a player, high level player like 2700 Super GM uh, switches from one federation to another. Um, we might talk about other players as well, uh, switching federations, but this is kind of the, the more controversial aspect of things. Um, recently, you guys may have heard that uh, Levon Aronian switched from his home country of Armenia to the United States. And there have been other uh, many high-profile cases like Wesley So, Dominguez, Caruana, all switching to the U.S. Um, you know, the led to Magnus saying things like the U.S. is, is buying nerds, uh, famously. Um, and yeah, lots and lots of um, different uh, issues. Before we get into on uh, the gory details, we should probably give everyone a, a brief understanding how we understand the rules work. Uh, who wants to take a crack at this? David, Jesse, because <laughs> I feel like we don't fully understand it. We we have the rules, but they are they are tricky. Actually, let yeah. me let me post the link in the chat for anyone who's curious about the FIDE handbook and specifically what it says. Uh, I'll post it in the Twitch chat. It'll also be in uh, the, the podcast, the show notes uh, on YouTube and so on. Um, but yeah, there you can read the regulations. Um, okay, maybe I'll take a crack at it. Long story I short, you got to pay yeah. a big fee. Uh, the Right now, the compensation that a federation has to pay to get a player is listed as 50,000 euros for a player of 2,700 rated and above. And then slightly lower, 30,000 for 2,600s. 10,000 for 2,500s, uh, and so on. And another 5,000 to FIDE. That 50,000 goes to the federation that is losing, so to speak, mm -hmm. the, uh, the 2,700 rated player. Right, losing the player. Um, another wrinkle to this is that if this fee is not paid, as far as I understand it right now, then that player is forbidden from representing the new federation uh, for two years in any kind of uh, official FIDE event. So this part is not clear, but according to their rules, it's like any kind of world championship qualifier, Olympiad, uh, continental championship, and uh, presumably any kind of World Cup qualifier. So it doesn't yeah. prevent the player, uh, from my understanding, to play in like open events and private events like uh, Wycon Zay, Dortmund, things like this. But any kind of official FIDE event where you're representing your federation, you would not be allowed to play, uh, presumably if this large fee isn't paid. Yeah, that's that's the best we could understand it, I think, is like there's the option of waiting or the option of the fee, like two different paths to switching federations. And something I just want to highlight or just underline is that for years, the way I've heard other people talk about this, and it was also my incorrect understanding, is that because people like to think of FIDE as a corrupt institution, maybe it is, they say things like FIDE is getting them, getting money. They're grabbing, there's a money grab by FIDE to do this when the players do the transfer. In fact, though, no, it's to the home federation. So if let's say Lanier Dominguez wanted to come here and not spend two years basically not playing, which he actually did, then he would have to pay 50,000 to the place he's trying to leave. And we'll talk about that dynamic a little bit when it comes to the morality of it. But anyways, I just wanna stress, FIDE is not actually grabbing a ton of money as is often stated. And I think I believe that for at least 20 years. <laughs> I was wrong, <laughs> yeah. this show helped me see I was wrong on that point. But I just wanna quickly agree yeah. with Jesse, like looking at the schedule of the fees that FIDE gets, there's like a fee for like $250 for processing or 250 euros for processing an application. And then depending on titles, there are fees, but the, the fee for an IM is, is 2,000 and the fee for a GM is 5,000 and the fee for titles lower than IM is less than that. So I don't think that that's um, particularly a, a money grab by FIDE. It's like fairly reasonable for like doing paperwork and dealing with stuff. You know, there's gonna be some administrative costs. So I'm with Jesse that they're not grabbing much money right here. Well, that's good. Um, I mean, maybe it's not. <laughs> we we should, could probably just do a full show on FIDE another time. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> a good show. That's take. a great show. Yeah, we should. 
definitely should. Um, okay, well, let's get into it. And, and we just want to see, like, just generally, how do you guys um, feel about it? Like, should it be allowed um, at all? I think some people say, like, once you play for a country, um, you're done. And actually, maybe, Jesse, if you know, like, the if there's, like, football rules on this, um, like... Because I feel like the FIFA has like similar similar rules. Once you play for a team in the World Cup, I'm not sure if you're even allowed to play for another team. Yeah, that's it. That's it, right? For, if you play for a national team, and I think there's an age cutoff. So like if you play in like a junior league or something like that, it doesn't affect it. But if you play as an adult, I'm going to guess it's 18. I don't watch any soccer, so someone in chat could correct us. But I it's somewhere around there, like you hit a certain age. And then if you've played for one national team, you can never play for another national team. Okay. No, that's, that's roughly correct. Yeah. And there's a big fights uh, actually in the soccer world. Like let's say a kid had an American dad and a Dutch uh, mother, then they're going to fight over what each federation is going to fight on who, who gets, who gets it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then once it's done, it's kind of done. That's my understanding of it. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, how do you guys feel about it in general? Do you think that the the rules are like currently uh, too strict, not strict enough about rights? And is there anything that you feel like is dramatically wrong with the system as it currently is? Yes, uh, <laughs> I'll go first. I think it's I, I think it's terrible uh, the current state of it. On um, you know. Uh, the U.S. Olympiad team could now be comprised entirely of players who have who have transferred to the Federation at the next <clears> Olympiad. <throat> like we could literally have four players playing for the U.S. Olympiad team, all of whom have done a Federation transfer. Um, and I think personally, not not to go into detail yet. I think personally, the the transfers as they are right now are good for the players transferring. Like for them, it gives them flexibility. It allows them to go to the highest bid from different national federations, essentially as if those were like teams hiring you in a professional uh, sports league of some kind. So it allows them to get the highest price and get the situation they want and like, you know, easily move between countries and live where they want to, which is cool. So for them, I think it's super good. I think for the fans, it's bad. And I think for the other players in these different countries, it's also bad. Um, so I think it's bad for basically everybody except the people transferring. And, 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 and I will also say for the federations that you transfer away from, it's, I think it's bad for those federations. I think that compensation fee of 50,000 euros is like peanuts for mm -hmm. a top 10 player. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like absolutely nothing actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just so how do you that's, feel? That's my overview and we'll get into to details. Yeah. Well, as in all dojo talks, I disagree with David. <laughs> I disagree with David. Um, I think um, I think the, the common take that you find on social media about these transfers is, particularly those that are coming to the U.S., is that some kind that we're like buying them. And what I want to stress in my knowledge of every single transfer, not just the ones to the U.S., is that the reason that people are transferring is because they have some kind of beef with their national organization. They feel uh, like they've been mistreated and they are gonna get out. And in a certain sense, there's gonna be a sense of vengeful glee on their part by doing this. Um, <clears throat> and that pertains to really all of the cases that I kind of have a little bit of awareness on. And this goes way back, I would say, uh, Korshnoi. Kamsky, Karyakin, Dominguez, Aronian. So all these guys had some kind of problem with their home country and moving here didn't necessarily, wasn't some immense financial gain for them. Uh, I don't think, and, and, and I think a lot of people are like, oh, St. Louis is buying them. They might help a little bit, but there's not, those guys are making money uh, in an international way and getting on the US team isn't that, I mean, when I say international way, I mean by playing tournaments abroad, getting on the US team isn't that big of a boost financially, right? So, um, but I do think a lot of these players, let's say going back, Korshnoi, Kamsky, all these guys felt like somebody was out to get them 
in their home federation and felt like, oh, I can set myself free of all this BS by getting out. And the country, with this is cool about the US, is like, we're very easy to assimilate to on a variety of levels. And you look at, say, a guy like Alex Yermolinsky, in a lot of ways, that guy's more American than Russian. Obviously, he's Russian in a lot of ways, but that guy's the American dream, man. <laughs> that guy's turned into the American dream. There's no one more American than Alex Yermolinsky. That guy's the personification living in the Dakotas. Give me a break. Um, so I think that the, the tape that we're, like, we're buying players is misleading. And I think when you look at each individual case, it's because of a personal grief. And even there's another interesting case with Georg Maya from Germany who transferred to Uruguay, dude. He was so upset at the German Federation that he transferred to Uruguay. So it goes down the line. Not and he's he's not the only German that's left the Federation, right? right. I mean, there was right. uh, Neidich. Neidich left, well, transferred yeah. to Azerbaijan. Um, Although yes. I think Neidich now wants to leave Azerbaijan. <laughs> So I'm, I'm honestly with both of you guys, it feels like it, it's definitely an issue if uh, a country is like, you know, doing like a New York Yankees kind of thing and just buying all the best players in the world. That doesn't seem fair uh, to anyone. Um, and uh, uh, but on the other hand, this isn't the only reason that, that people are switching. It might probably might not even be the main reason, as Jesse is saying, is that there's all these like issues with your federation and um for example, in like Wesley So's case, I, I remember he was extremely upset with the Philippines Federation. He was saying like they weren't supporting him in any way whatsoever, despite being like their top player and the superstar. So it feels like there has to be a mechanism in place for players to be able to switch. Um, and my feeling is like, you know, if you genuinely move to another country and you live there, it's like, and yeah, you want to play for that country, it makes sense that you should be allowed to, like you're now living in a new place. Um, so yeah, it feels like there has to be some kind of balance here. Um, my feeling is that like, I don't know, like we're not going to buy Magnus. Somehow I have a feeling like Magnus is never going to play for the, the U S team, right? So it's never just going to be like this, like superpower. And, um, no, no, it's already a superpower. Yeah, we're already a superpower. Come on. <laughs> we are a superpower. Granted, but it's not like we're just going down to the list, like offering Magnus, you know, a billion dollars and number two, like here's some money, number three, number four. Like, okay, Caruana, I mean, he's an American, right? I think he he always had the right to switch. Wesley So, you know, was going Caruana to school here for, for Italy. many years. He's a transfer for sure. Well, he transferred to Italy and then back. Yeah. And but so he I, transferred to Italy, like, I think before he was a GM. He transferred back when he was over 2750. Yes. So he's definitely a transfer. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I don't know. My feeling is it's not like he was bought. I mean, I, I think he probably had other reasons to switch to the U.S. as well. Um, so it's like, yeah, a lot of different factors. I mean, I, I guess the question is, like, how do we balance the people that have, uh, let's call it, a genuine reason to switch versus the people just doing it for financial gain or whatever you want to call it. And I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to balance it. I think that FIDE tried maybe with these fees, but like, yeah, clearly it's not really a whole lot for a top player. And let me, let's talk about Levon just for a sec. Cause one thing that uh, was brought up in kind of a joking way is really interesting, which was, could we imagine buying magnets? Now, of course it's <laughs> unthinkable, but, just dial your mind back to when Armenia won the Olympiad. It was a huge deal in Armenia. There was like parades and Aronian was like this big star, huge, massive deal in Armenia. So to imagine at that point that Levon could play for any other nation, uh, unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable. Um, and especially the way the Armenians have their own chess culture and culture in general, also in the diaspora here in the United States. Um, and one of the things too, I wanna say about Levon case that's so interesting is it's not like, I mean, he's obviously an amazing player, one of maybe one of the best it's ever been, but it's not like he's gonna be that huge of an addition to our Olympic team because uh, he's almost 40, dude, it's not going to, it's not going to be that much longer, LeVon. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be that much longer that you can make the team. This team's competitive, man. 
you know? So I think for, for that was one of the many cases which highlight to me, like Levon was pissed. I don't even know the exact backstory. I don't know if anyone does, but Levon was pissed at the way the Federation treated him, you know, his own Federation. Not so Armenia, so not anything else, but, you know, I think some of the nastiest politics, actually, actually, we've seen this in the U.S. chess, some of the nastiest politics happen on the national chess level, right? U.S. chess has been torn apart since I was a kid. Those people have been infighting with each other, basically doing nothing. We had to end, end it up, you know, St. Louis stole the U.S. championship from them because they were so nasty amongst themselves, <laughs> you know? And I think it's the same in other countries too, right? There's huge infighting amongst people that usually aren't even chess players themselves at the top of the national federations. So Jesse, you said that as always, you were going to disagree with me, but I'm going to yeah. agree with you about something. I okay. agree with you that if you look at the reason why a lot of players transferred, it, it may seem like it's because they're upset with their national federation. And mm -hmm. so just like Kostya, I believe that there should be some mechanism for players to transfer. I, I think it's reasonable to create a mechanism just because some national federations are so terrible, or maybe all of them are so terrible that it's it seems like heinous to tell the player, sorry, you're trapped here, right? And like maybe they liked their national federation, then somebody else took over the federation, you know, with their cronies and like, you know, and now they don't like the federation. And so what you played for the federation for years and now you don't like it and you still have to. I, I, I definitely see that as being an issue. I don't completely agree at the same time. I don't think that's mutually exclusive to players being bought. That's what I would say. Like, I think players can be leaving because they've got beef with their national federation, but they can also be bought because if you look where these players are ending up, is it a coincidence that Caruana, Aronian, Dominguez and Wesley so all ended up in the US. Is that just like the place that they always wanted to live or something like that? Mm -hmm. Like they may have been upset with the Philippines Federation, with the Italian Federation. I don't know what they ever did to Fabi, um, but maybe, maybe he was upset with them. The Armenian Federation, again, obviously was very supportive at some point, but now he's upset. Um, and the Cuban Federation, maybe they had gripes with all those federations that make sense and they had reasons to leave them, but look where they all ended up. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that all of them except Lanier had their fees paid for them by St. Louis, by, by Sinkfield. Mm -hmm. That's my suspicion, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say they were bought. Now, were they, were they on an open market or were they on the market because they were upset? So, okay, you can be upset. You may want to switch, but they're all going to, you know, one billionaire. Uh, I don't think that's just a coincidence. I think they're also being bought once they're upset. And I want to just stress a, a factual point that David referenced here that I, to me is just an amazing story where, you know, Lin, imagine you're Lanier Dominguez. You're in your 30s. You know that chess isn't going to last. You're not going to be at the top forever. And you have a problem with Cuba. It's easy to imagine any number of problems with both the Cuban Chess Federation and living in Cuba at the moment. Mm -hmm. And people are thinking that Rex is buying all these people. But in fact, Lanier moved here, established residency, and basically didn't play chess for two years. So that, as far as we can tell, he didn't want to pay the 50,000 euros to Cuba. And I think... If we imagine it, it's not just the money that had, you know, the pain of having spending to spend money, but I think it was also the pain of giving those SOBs 50 grand. <laughs> I yeah. think it was also that. No way are they going to get 50 grand from me, buddy. No. So it's like these really interesting dynamics. Uh, man. Yeah. So yeah. I, just I mean, he could, have, that. he could have earned so much more than 50 grand in two years of playing at the level that he is at, right? right? Which was like, he was like number 10 approximately in the world on 2750 plus and i'm sure that sinkfield would have paid the 50 grand for him as well so he wouldn't have even had to pay it so uh, the only scenario i can imagine is that he like hated some people that federation so much <laughs> <laughs> that he wouldn't even give them that pittance uh-huh yeah yeah it's a crazy story I'll tell a quick funny story. Uh, so <clears throat> one of the things that we're going to talk about dave's reference is um 
to what extent it's hurting people in the federations they come to. For example, all these people come to the U.S. means a lot of top players don't get a chance to play for the Olympic team that otherwise would have had a chance. Now, of course, and when I was a kid, it was always a big debate. People were upset with the Russians being here. They're like, oh, these Russians, man, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I can never win anything, man. And they're taking all my money. I don't have a chance to win any of these tournaments. It was never any big money in those open tournaments anyway. But still, <laughs> but still, it was like a thing that people talked about. Sorry, Justin, you're talking about the Russians that transferred to the U.S., like your Malinsky. They transferred to the U.S., exactly. Basically at the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Like they were like right. Soviets when they left and then like, you know, became Russian Americans en route or something like. Right. And even before the dissolution, there was a bunch of Russians here. And what I just want to say on a personal level is I'm thankful for all those Russians being here because it definitely improved the standard of play across the board, not just at the top, but like there was a, a trickle down effect in their teaching playing throughout the United States. Um, so I wanted to mention that as that's something I feel strongly about. And also just the story I wanted to relate is, you know, that I, I've always dreamed about playing on the Olympic uh, team. And, um, you know, why? Because it's a nice, it's a nice tournament. There's a nice history to it. There's like, you know, the magic about playing in an event like that. Uh, and so, for example, now when I'm trying to do this senior stuff, well, it's because I would like to play events like the U.S. senior or the world senior, yada, yada. So anyways, I was at a tournament years ago and this guy from Jamaica comes up to me. He's like, dude, you could transfer to Jamaica and you could play on the Jamaican Olympic team and you could play in the Olympia. Oh, and I've been thinking about that forever, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would have been worse places to move than to establish residency in Jamaica just so I could go play in the Olympia. And I think one of the hilarious things about that is one, it's stuck with me. It's like something I've always thought about. Uh, and two, I think I was not motivated though by a sport I wasn't being spawned in any way by the US Federation. Not that they've been good to me or anything. They've done nothing for me, but I didn't feel any personal animosity that was like pushing me away. If that had been there, like that would have been the kick maybe to make me do something obscene like that, just so that I could play in the Olympia. <laughs> you know? But that would be like, that would be the payoff for me, but getting to play in the vet like that. Yeah. So I, for me, I feel like a good compromise uh, because to me, it, it seems like the main issue is just the, just the Olympiad, right? It's just like no. your the, the teams are strong and no, 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 that's taking a huge away misconception that it's just affecting the Olympiad. Well, what, what else is it affecting? Here's the most important thing it affects is tournament invitations all across the year, because when organizers are setting up a tournament, like Wake on Zay, Dortmund, the Grand Chess Tour, anything like that, they want national diversity to bring in different pools of fans to watch mm. the tournament. So I happen, I happen to know from like talking to some other top American players that when they want to play at a tournament, they'll be told, oh, sorry, we have enough Americans already because the tournament will have, you know, so and, and, and Caruana or something like that. And so... If you look at like the peak of Shanklin's career when he won the U.S. championship and hit 2730, and then he lost 30 points over the next year. The big reason he lost rating points over the next year was that he was like the highest rated player at every tournament he played. And people just like tried to draw him. They knew that he was like, they'd realized he was good and they just tried to draw him. And they drew him and they drew him and they drew him and like he got a little frustrated and then he lost one game and then they drew him and they drew him and they drew him, you know, and for you to have a new US champion with that kind of rating and they can't like play in any tournaments against the higher rated players who are 25, 27, 60 and 80 and 90 is like crazy. And it's actually codified in the Grand Chess Tour that they can have a maximum of three players from one country in the Grand Chess Tour. So that affects Russia, and now it affects the U.S. On the other hand, Shanklin got to that 2730 by having the chance to play in the U.S. championship, which had all those strong players. And that's the only place he's ever played them, by the way. When he plays other tournaments in the U.S. on his way up, none of those people are ever in those tournaments. 
and he got to hang out and play and like study with them at the Olympiad when he was the uh, reserve. When he was playing the reserve board. Mm. <laughs> I mean, he got to play on the board next to them. But honestly, all these 2730s, it's a rough life, buddy. <laughs> it's a rough life being 2730. You don't get invited. You're not top 10. You are not top 10 at 2730. You do not get to play in the big events at 2730. The only time you do is if, you know, you get um, some event maybe in St. Louis and you get the invitation. 2730 is a rough life. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I just don't see what the alternative is, David. I mean, like, what do you do with Dominguez, right? You can't ask them to just sit out, you know, playing chess forever, right? Like, no, I mean, what the guidelines should be is a very, very good question. But it's, I, me, I, this... I, just, I just wanted to be clear that we're not just talking about like playing in one tournament yeah. or the appearance fee for one tournament. Like this like really like devastates the careers of Shankland, Xiong, Robson, um, Sevion. I mean, like, like, like all those guys who could have been an Olympiad team together, right? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really brutal. important point. It's brutal. Like they're just not getting the practice at that level they're not getting the invitations they're not getting the income yeah i don't know but to me it just seems like that's like an issue with with organizers right because there's so many tournaments out there and there's a lot of online events uh it's kind of surprising that they can't seem to invite uh multiple players from the same country and i don't know i think i think for the junior players like they're they typically do get invited to stuff like why and and things like this so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I if mean, I if I were to suggest something, um, you know, obviously I haven't thought through like a precise policy that I could lay out in like FIDE handbook style. Um, but my sense would be that you would make some requirements about the person's residence and material participation in the national uh, federation that they're switching to. Right. So like when Jesse says that Sam like got his 2730 by getting to like play those people at the U S championships, <laughs> the truth is I would argue that Sam Jeffrey, et cetera, have benefited very, very little from the presence of those players. I can imagine a scenario where one of those players comes to the country. And then it means that Jeffrey gets to play four games a year against Fabiano Caruana because Fabiano lives in the same country as him. Or he gets like do like a you know a training camp with him or something like that. That could be like a benefit, but I don't believe that's happened with these really top players that we're discussing right now. Yeah, I'm definitely with you, David. That it's like it's not good for the the homegrown players. Like a lot of people say, like oh, it's very motivating, but it, mm, I think they're already motivated enough. Like they well, I, yeah. honestly, I think it's demotivating. Yeah. I mean, imagine if Robson were like ten points shy of the Olympiad team versus like he knows that he's never going to play on the U.S. Olympiad team. He just knows it. You've got like a young, super talented player, and he knows he's never going to play on the Olympiad team. And, and he knows he's never going to get an invitation to an elite tournament either, ever. So first of all, Robeson was uh, an alternate one year. Second of all, it's the same thing with the Russians when I was a kid. They raised the level of play. It became much tougher. Was it a, ultimately a good thing? Of course it was. Back in the day, there was no elite events in the U.S. No, they were all in Europe. They were yeah. all in your, you couldn't play here. Now we have a couple elite events a year. Fantastic. Why do we have them? Because a lot of, in a lot of ways, so is here. Fabi's here. Dominguez is here. Great. But those tournaments, Great. those tournaments just take the imported players and then give them chances to play against MVL. And well, it used to be Aronian would play against, you know, against Dominguez and, and Caruana and so, but it, it doesn't include Robson. It doesn't include Sevion. I disagree. So, I did a uh, commentary there several times at the St. Louis Chess Club where we had the Winter Open, for example. Very strong players. Who was there? Sevian was there. Jean was there. Robson was there. And they But who played. were they playing against? They were playing against a bunch of 26 and 2700s. They were playing against players higher rated yeah. than them? Yeah, it was tough, man. How it was oh, there? Nice. Shanklin, how it beat Shanklin, an amazing game. Oh, man. Yeah, no. And, the, and I, by the way, the 2730s, man, it's a rough life. How was one of them? Not yeah. so easy. Let, Gawain let me Jones, provide, Gawain let Jones me, was there. Let me tell you that. Oh, man, it's so hard when you're 27 something. It's a hard life, my friend. 
Well, yeah. let, let me provide you a contrast, which I think will be probably pretty clear to you between the wave of Soviet players that, that came, uh-huh. you know, 20 years ago and, and the current imports. Yermolinsky played like what? Like 30 open tournaments a year in the US, <laughs> right? right? Um, who else? Vojkiewicz, uh, Kudrin, um, you know, Shabalov. Shabalov, I just, I just logged on the other day to check out some tournament that Kostya was playing in, right? Yeah. And Shabalov was playing in the North American Open, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Like these guys, they warriored their way around the country. They played nonstop. They did, you know, postmortems with American players. Mm-hmm. They played with people. They raised the, le- I agree. They raised the level dramatically by their presence, mm-hmm. okay? I believe, you know, they played the World Open. They played the U.S. Open. They played small little weekend things, the Far yeah. West Open, the yeah. Connecticut Class Championships. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I, I like where you're going with this, David, because it's it sounds like instead of, let's say, a player switches – and then they're forbidden for for playing for two years. It sounds like what you want is if a player switches, they're forced to play events play. in a new country as play much nonstop. as they can. Yeah. And these people did camps, more, more right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Yermo was 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 uh, was the the GM in residence at the mechanics. You know, I got to like watch lectures of his or have like lessons with him or just talk to him about chess. And like a lot of those other guys, also they did that, right? They taught camps, right? At at Emory, all, you remember the summer series of like chess camps, uh-huh. you know, yeah. where like you would pile in like hundreds of kids and they'd get a lecture from Yuri Shulman. Okay, let right? me just say something obvious though. The difference there is those guys weren't really in the top 20 or even often top 50 in the world. And when you look back on those times, uh, you could say Sarawan was. Did Sarawan play the open events? No. He was always in Europe, my friends. That guy was never playing all those events you just mentioned. Why? Mm-hmm. Because he had managed to make it into the top 20, 30 in the world. Yeah. Right? And but, that's what okay, you do so when you're top that 20, could be, 30. You that could play. be the reason for the contrast, but I think it's a very important contrast, okay? Because uh, I would argue that those players contributed tremendously to U.S. chess. Yeah, I agree. Okay? And I would argue that the players we're talking about now, the current U S Olympiad team have contributed nothing. Oh, come on. Jen Shahada named her kid Fabi, dude. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's we not got, a we contribution. Got like a huge, huge cultural influence of <laughs> these players playing for uh, us. To, to be fair, you know, Wesley. So has played a bunch of opens like in Vegas, yeah. St. Louis, like he, he's played a lot of the big open tournaments. Yeah. Um, Caruana, not so much. Dominguez, I, I don't think so. I don't know about not so much. I would say zero. Zero, zero, zero. Well, he played like zero. millionaire chess, I think. At least once. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very good point. But um, yeah, it sounds like maybe there is some room for uh, some kind of discussion here because it's like you're saying that if they're contributing to the new country – then that's cool. They can be treated as if they're a homegrown American. I'm saying that's an important contrast between the two groups of players we're talking about. And maybe if we follow that contrast down logically, we could come up with some guidelines or standards that would make it profitable. Because currently I see it as being like good for them, but not good for anybody else. So it'd be great if you could come up with a way of having these transfers that was not necessarily like net positive for everybody, but had at least some benefit or some positive, you know, contribution as well as just being good for them. Cause like, look, if this is good for you, then maybe you could afford to make it good for other people too, hmm. you know, without making it a negative thing for yourselves. Right. I, I mean, it would be weird if the FIDE regulation said like must teach like a summer camp uh-huh. once or something <laughs> like that. I understand that looks like really weird, but I think if uh-huh. we follow this line of reasoning, we can come up with something less weird where they actually in some way contribute. I, they don't need to contribute for me. I mean, you, you can come or not come. And, you know, like, I don't think Levon, I don't know if it's in, like, I don't, th- I think the, the implication, for example, for Levon is that somehow he got a lot of money. I don't think he got a lot of money. He might've, maybe someone paid that 50 grand for him, but I don't think he got a lot of money. Is he going to even spend most of his time here? Probably not. Probably play on the Olympic team once or twice at the most before 
the cognitive decline is too intense and then he has so to why start. should he play for the team if he doesn't even live here you're like saying he's not even going to live here because right? i'm telling you that he it doesn't have to do with us it has to do with his home federation this is because he's pissed it doesn't well then anything. he could choose to play for no country but why should everybody play for the u.s i think it's easier when you have a country to play for like for example Faruja did this weird thing where he was like i'm an international citizen and then he's yeah. like, okay, wait, it's easier to play for France. <laughs> Let's play for France. Well, I'm sure he was offered something as well. Maybe, maybe, but it's also a good home base to have, to be in France. And you can do European tournaments all your life. And yeah. Sure. But where do you think Aronian's going to live now? My world citizen, wherever okay. his latest girlfriend is from. That's where he's going to live. That's what I think. <laughs> Yeah. But David, how did, how does this deal with, I mean, the main problem you mentioned that like, and players are still losing invites, even if Aronian does play like some opens in the U S and, right. and so on. So here's the thing, like Sam has told me he's only ever played these people in the U S championship. He gets to play them mm -hmm. like once per year, right? Mm -hmm. They would be contributing to American chess, for example, if Xiong, Savion, Robson, et cetera, got to play them like four times a year. So if there were some like requirement that they play a few tournaments, on U.S. soil every year, for example, mm. that'll be a way for them to contribute because people would get to play against them and and learn from them that way. Mm. Um, I understand they're like peak professional players; they're not supposed to be out like you know recording like like lessons like we are. You know, they 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 have another calling. I'm not demanding all their time, right? But I mean, there has to be some kind of contribution, I think, for it to to make sense. See, because what I would say is. For, from their perspective, you've got a couple tournaments in St. Louis that are on the level to play in. And for open tournaments, our open tournaments are nasty, as Kostya can just attest to. And I can attest to, we do not have great open tournaments, either in prize funds or in conditions or just like you know, playing conditions. When we say conditions, a lot of times GM say that be like, did you give me playing fair, for example? No, we don't have those either. So when you look at Fabi, he's playing opens all around the place, man. That guy never stops playing. He loves to play. Same thing with Carlson. They're playing every single event that they're invited to. I think well, it's madness, but that's the way they're doing it. You know, well, then maybe St. Louis, you know, could put more of their money into organizing a nice tournament instead of just like paying them to switch federations. They, they pay a lot of money to do nice tournaments. Yeah. They I mean, they, harder. Yeah. They, they do play a lot of money. those events. So you know, make, make some events where American players get to play but against they the do. Imports. This is what I'm saying. They have the winter. No, no, no. When, when you said there was a nice tournament, you said that Shanklin got to play against Howell. That's not, that's not one of the imports. Uh, okay. And Shanklin's okay, rated just as John high as Howell. Was there. That's not like a special like, was there. opportunity no, but, that Wesley so brought him. But those St. Louis tournaments, I believe are designed just to give the, the lower rated players a chance to play against international stars. Right, right. I mean, right. so it would be kind of counter, it would defeat the purpose to have like Caruana, Aronian, Dominguez playing those events. Exactly. Yeah. It's pretty, but, just but I mean, that's just what you're saying. That's just what St. Louis has done because they want to promote American chess. They weren't required yeah. to do that by FIDE. You know, they didn't have any obligation. It's just they, they wanted to support, uh, my feeling the lower rated players as well lower rate you know the 2650s and 2700s um in u.s chess yeah yeah i mean well this also sounds like a very uh specific issue to the u.s because it seems like the u.s is the only place uh where where this is happening um well well but we got to think about cardiac and that was amazing an event i think yeah i think that had to do with money but also opportunities, right? And the course, no, I did too. That was money plus opportunities. Like both of those guys felt like they weren't getting the opportunities within their home country. Karyakin, of course, switched from Ukraine to Russia. And then Korshnoi, of course, left and played for Switzerland. You know, was there a lot of money for Korshnoi? No, I don't think so. But he was able to play in all these events and he got his little revenge. I mean, the guy was out for revenge <laughs> and he almost got it. He almost got the ultimate revenge, but then blew it in a couple of key games against Karpov, of course. Yeah. So I don't think the U.S. is the only country it, it happens to, but I do think we're an immigrant country. I think that is one of the things that's happening is that if you're going to 
If you were going to leave a place and fit in some other place, this is the place to do it. This is the place to come. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the other aspect to this is just this whole like nationalism thing. I mean, yeah, like everyone immigrated to the U.S. at some point. <laughs> so why should special preference be given to the players whose families immigrated a little bit earlier? <laughs> but I, I do... I do like the idea that the player that, you know, plays for a country should live there, should be an mm -hmm. actual, yeah, so that's, that's what would be sad if, like, yeah, we have people living all over Europe and all over the world, and then they all, like, join up for the, the U.S. Olympiad team and then, and so on. Uh, it seems like, yeah, it should be, uh, you should be a citizen of the country uh, you're playing for. Well, in, in a way, one of the things there that's a, a, let's say a related issue is uh, for the US championship, I do think it was controversial in a number of years where somebody who had a residency wasn't a citizen was allowed to play in the US championship. And that's still the case if it's not, uh, there's some years where the US championship is a qualifier event to like, you know, stuff like the Grand Prix. In those years, uh, you have to be a citizen and have to have, a, you know, belong to the U.S. Federation. But in other years, if you are just a resident, if you have established residence in the U.S., then you're allowed to play, which makes it that sometimes doesn't feel right to me. Honestly, somebody who's a resident, that makes more sense to me than somebody who's like filed some paperwork. Uh huh. Right. Well, you, you know what I mean, though, like you've seen guys and you're like, really, you're playing for the U.S. You know, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we have all these cases like, so yeah, Koryakin uh, was, was crazy though. To me that, I mean, that seemed just like a, another nationalism identity kind of thing rather than financial. I think he, mm -hmm. from what I've heard, I mean, it sounds like he has always felt like Russian uh, himself. And so it wasn't even like a necessarily a switch for him. I, I don't really know, but that's just what it seemed like. And now he's like a big, big Putin guy. Um, and you have like all the journeymen, like uh, I keep thinking about Shira, right? Because he switched like yeah. Latvia, Spain, Latvia, Spain, like back and yeah. forth. <laughs> uh, probably just because of issues with the, the Federation, I would imagine. Um, yeah. And then and then the question of whether me and Jesse should go play for some country and finally uh -huh. get, <laughs> get to the Olympiad. <laughs> What about that motivation? But then we'd be we'd be punishing the players in that home country, wouldn't we? Unless you moved there and contributed. But yes, imagine if Jesse never moved to Jamaica and just decided to play for the Jamaican team and uh -huh. paid paid the fee at Jesse's rating. It wouldn't be that big. It would be like ten thousand yeah. probably instead of fifty thousand, yeah. right? Jesse, what's your fee? I guess, dude. Yeah. I mean, oh. at the time I was like 2,500 or whatever. And then I don't know yeah. whatever fee that would have been. Yeah. If you're 2,500, it's 10,000. If you're 2,499, it's 6,000. You play for the Jamaican team. Let's say you never, you never move to Jamaica. You just play yeah. for their team. Yeah. You don't play any tournaments in Jamaica. You don't hang out with any Jamaican players. Yeah. There's not many tournaments. That'd be so sad. They so, seem like they have such a cool and like friendly team. Like I've seen them. So, at like the world youth and stuff. So what, <laughs> what, what would you say to the one Jamaican player that you'd bump off their team in that situation? I would say, dude, I've always wanted to play at the Olympia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say. And inside, I mean, you would feel like you'd just done him dirty. I don't know. I don't know. You know, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, I don't feel like so feels that way about kicking, say, Shanklin or whoever it is he's kicking off. It's totally fine. Come, come to this country. It was, and I just want to say, let's say something just totally obvious. As Americans, we have a different sensibility when it comes to national identity. I.e. It's totally reasonable for us to imagine, at least for me, someone like your Malinsky coming to America and becoming even more American than most Americans I know, right? Whereas for, I think, let's say the Russians, it's just inconceivable. And we saw that interestingly with the Duboff controversy where he didn't switch federations, he just went and helped Magnus be a second for a while. That was like a huge deal for the Russians, a massive deal. So it kind of this question of like national identity, how do you feel about it, you know, plays into this discussion. Um, 
And I think it then turns into when people think of it that way, they're like, oh yeah, the Americans are buying all this stuff. When, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it was ultimately about money that we can disagree about that or it might've been some money or whatever, but I don't think it was ultimately about the money. But all I wanna say is the obvious that because our sense, American sense of national identity is far more fluid than other countries it feels more acceptable for us to do it. And that's the reason why I think you have more people coming here because it's easy for them to imagine themselves being American than it would be for me to say, try to be Armenian. Oh my God, I can't be Armenian. I'm not <laughs> Armenian, man, no way. Right. right. So, like you so, can, yeah. so honestly, to each of you, like how would you feel if you got some money to play the Olympiad for the Jamaican team? How would you feel about it? Would you, would you do it? Well? And if you did it, would you feel good about it? I mean, honestly, guilty? Let, let's just say the whole thing with Jamaica as a thought experiment, the, the hard part for me was just like, oh my God, I'd have to do some paperwork. I might have to move there. It's just like the hassle was too intense. And the 10,000 in that case, you know, cause what am I doing? I'm buying like a ticket to the Olympiad if I had done something like that, right? And then 10,000 in that case would kind of hurt. It'd be like, well, I got this dream and if it's gonna cost me $10,000, I don't know, it kind of hurt, man, you know? So some rich um, dude there pays the 10,000 for you. And does the paperwork too? And does the paperwork. Oh, it's all just yeah. profit for you. And the only cost is, you know, you donk somebody else off. Oh yeah, I do. I, I sure, yeah, I don't have any problem with that. Yeah. And um, you wouldn't feel bad? No, I wouldn't feel bad. <laughs> I mean- Thank you. I mean, what would I do? I play one or two Olympiads. I may hang out with some people, might hang out in Jamaica for a while. It'd be great life experience. Oh, I'd love to live in Jamaica for a couple of years, man. Are you kidding me? What have I done? Hey, cry, what have you done? Now you're stuck in Baltimore. Why didn't you go to Jamaica, buddy? You had the chance. Wait, I yeah. feel like Jesse's not, I think Jesse didn't quite get the question because he's saying he would live in Jamaica for a couple of years. David was just asking whether- I was you saying just, you don't live you there. Stay All in the you do US. is you just take their spot in a couple of tournaments. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, I, I, I'm i sure I would visit, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> LeVon's visited, you know. For me, that would be the fun part is actually moving to the country and, yeah. and uh, being like the uh, the head honcho there. <laughs> Jesse wiping his tears with $100 yeah. bill. I feel okay, awful but again, about imagine this. you just you just take the spot, Costa. How do you feel? Well, no, if I move to Jamaica and I become uh, a member of their team and I'm like helping uh, coach everyone, I, I'd feel great. I think that sounds but, awesome. <laughs> but you're again not answering the question correctly. No, 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 but but that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't be interested if it was just uh, you wouldn't Olympia. want to do it otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it'd be cool like to play the Olympiad once, but it'd also just be very strange. And yeah, I would feel like right. an absolute intruder. <laughs> I honestly, and I don't want to say this in like, you know, an insulting way, Jesse, but like, I find like a surprising lack of like guilt or morality of sense or sense of what's good for other people mm -hmm. um, in the attitude that you could take something from someone and not feel bad about it. And you saying like, I'm sure Wesley so doesn't care about like, you know, Robson or, or whatever. I, to me, that's very bizarre. I would never mm -hmm. feel that way about, about any of these situations. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't do it because I would think it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But I, I, sh I feel like we really have to point out none of the U.S. players have fit this like hypothetical, right? Wesley So has been living here for many years. Caruana, yeah. Aronian's living in St. Louis. I think Dominguez as well. I mean, it's, they're all living in the U.S. It's not like anyone is right, actually right, right. Yeah. Uh, a fully just like paid, paid hand. So the question is whether they should be playing more events in the U.S., doing more mm -hmm. for like the U.S. Uh, scene, circuit, community, et cetera. And by the way, when we talk about contribution to the U.S., if you want to, let's say you're young and you don't have any commitments and you want to learn chess, move to St. Louis and just start hanging around that club, analyzing with the people who come in. It's stunning. It is stunning what you will discover there. In conversation, just people having fun, you know, it's, a, it's incredible. And we're not just talking about the 2750 plus players. We're talking about like 2600s that you might not even know about. No, They're you're definitely out. not talking about the 2750 players. I doubt you could walk into the club and just like do a hangout session with uh, Dominguez or, or. Oh, no, Bobby. I disagree. If you are hanging out there at a tournament and you just wait around where the people come down for the postmortem, you can hang out. You can hang out. It might not be cool for you to open your mouth. That's not hanging out. Jesse. 
But if you're if you're socially cool, you can open your mouth. I mean, you don't want to be, you know, running over their analysis sessions with your dumb ideas, but you can definitely ask questions if you're polite about it. You know, there's no reason you can't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a vibrant scene in St. In St. Louis, I think you can probably find like players from two or three different like universities teams who are really strong, who are 2,600, who play like uh, tournaments at the St. Louis club and who might do mm -hmm. like analysis and give lectures. I'm sure there's all kinds of, I'm sure it's got the most vibrant chess life there is. I just suspect that Wesley So, Lanier Dominguez, Fabiana Caruana and Levon Aronian have nothing to do with the vibrant chess scene in St. Louis. Oh, I disagree, man. No, yeah, I no, they, I know they definitely... Yeah. They'll yeah. spend time there. They'll hang out. I mean, a lot of them live there. So like, yeah. But, um, yeah, clearly could be, could be more, could be more. And, and, you know, go down the line because it's, what's interesting about it is there's like a real trickle down and you can think about all of our university programs, just take the UTD uh, systems. You got loads of American players going there who are, let's say they're 2,000, 2,100 when they get there. They get to hang out and train with the top players. Amazing. What an amazing experience. Yeah. So all these people coming here, yes, they're knocking off some spots or something, but they're overall making the scene much more strong. Much more strong. And do I understand, Shanklin, if he wants to whine a little bit? Sure. And I understood the people who whined about the Russians 20 years ago. Forget about it. Forget about it. You're, you're, you're getting a service. And as I've always said to myself, cry, you should be thankful for every punch in the face you've ever got, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think uh, where people like Shanklin have gotten, it's because of like their hard work, right? I don't think it, it's going to come down to things like uh, the opportunities and stuff like that. Like, it's not like he got to where he is because of like amazing opportunities, right? It's because he was working really hard on his chest. So I think that's still going to be the the biggest part. But it is a shame. I completely sympathize like for him, Zhang, Robson, uh, especially if they're not getting invited to to Europe and stuff. But I mean, I don't know. There's lots of lots of open like Gibraltar is super strong every single year. And a lot of those top guys play there. So maybe it's getting better. I do feel like it's a little bit on the organizers as well to try and um, invite more more juniors and stuff. But, well, there's only only so many tournaments out there. Yeah. And we haven't even mentioned this yet, but I would say it also makes a mockery of the Olympiad when the U.S. team is like all these like top players who aren't from the U.S. Like the, the, the competition's not as interesting. Okay. So, but imagine... Uh, I don't or know, fans. Let's say 25 years ago when it was Kaidenov, Yermolinsky, maybe it was Golden, all these guys. Uh, you had um, Boris Golko. Was that bad for us? No. Was that it a was mockery? Fine. That was fine. I was cool. It didn't with make them. a mockery of the Olympiad, though. I remember, I remember reading, you know, a whining message in Chess Life from a from a yeah. US player at that time yeah. about it. And I disagreed. I, I think that was totally fine. Those people moved here. They lived here. They taught here. They worked mm -hmm. here. They played here. And the Olympiad was competitive and interesting. Yeah. But but now it's like you have to root for every other team. No. The West because they're like these like tiny, tiny little Davids against the Goliath. It's not even that way. The Chinese team is amazing. Russian team's amazing. Ukrainian team's amazing. It's not an. It's not some rollover event. No, it's still really hard. It's still really. Yeah, hard. I mean, there's a lot of good chess players in the world. The event is hard, but the U.S. has like an insane team. Yeah. To the point of you know, it's not. It's not as interesting as it as it could be. Well, we'll see, especially with LeVon playing uh, this next time. I think it will be, <laughs> if LeVon actually plays. For yeah, it, no, I mean, I, I think it's still it's super really interesting. interesting. Like the, yeah. because the US, we won uh, one gold the first time we had like Caruana and so I think on, on the team, or maybe the second, but that one was very, very close. Like we barely won it over a tie break uh, over like, I think like Ukraine or something. And right. like Russia has the highest rated team every single year and they haven't won in, in forever. I think it's still a very fascinating yeah, event. Yeah. And um, yeah. 
it's definitely getting more and more competitive with like China, India, Uzbekistan is going to be gold you know, next time. Uzbekistan, yeah. Uzbekistan. No, I mean, yeah. I was getting all excited to root for Iran, you know, for several years I've rooted for the Iranian team. So as a fan of that team, I was really disappointed when Farouja left. I'm not saying he shouldn't have left. I'm just saying like, you know, there was a moment in time where I was like, wow, like Iran, which is not like famous as like a top chess power. They've got was very like, two extremely talented 14-year-olds, an amazing 13-year-old, and a mm. pretty good 16-year-old. In like four years, they could be a really good team. And then you see them start like finishing in like 15th place when they're ranked 30th, right? And then finishing in mm. like eighth place when they're ranked 17th. And you're like, oh, this is amazing. And then like, oh no, that's it. Yeah. Let's, so um... just, again, I'm not saying I'm against that transfer, but I'm saying like as a fan of the Iranian team, that, that sucked. Yeah. But um, okay, very very specific case with Iran. Like they're, they're not exactly the actually, most sporting. Uh, one thing we really, I really want to just a little footnote here about Aronia is that what a lot of people don't realize is there are more Armenians. This this might be apocryphal, but it's close enough to true that I might as well say it. this. The apocryphal statement, I think it might be true. I think there's more Armenians in LA than Armenia. I mean, it's, it's a huge community that lives in. Kostya knows Southern them, and it's not more. <laughs> it, it was it's amazing. It wasn't it's true amazing. last time I checked. I believe Glendale is the biggest diaspora outside of Armenia, but I don't think it's overtaken. In no. any case, there's there's, there's three million people in Armenia, uh-huh. and you know, there's like six to eight million people in LA. Uh huh. I'm just trying to tell you guys that the Armenian diaspora in the United States is massive, and it's established itself in a way that it's 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 not like you're coming to a foreign country you know there is like you can be you can move to the united states and you could just live completely within armenian circles i don't think that's what his intention is but i'm just trying to say like it's an important strand of the story to understand you know yeah. understand. i i also used to root for the armenian team in aronian and now i can't yeah. now i can't really do it in the same way anymore yeah it is um and it really i mean it's a fascinating decision and um, I think probably, you know, it's where it's really going to blow up is if he plays at the Olympiad, which I assume he will, then it will truly be like the question will arise again, you know, in a, in a bigger form. It's yeah. Like that. uh, that's the other thing, though. It's like that's what America is all about. Like we're just this huge melting pot. So it's like almost in our DNA that people come here <laughs> to become yeah, American. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if they want to come here and live here, that's awesome, right? Yeah. Well, but yeah. they do. But I don't I mean, feel like he's coming to melt. I feel like he's just well, let's give him a chance. Let's give him a chance to melt. Let's give him, give him a chance to melt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh that's funny. Well, um okay, I, I can definitely say, yeah, I do feel like they're it, rules should be should be changed right because there's like this huge uh fee but it's like not that big of a fee it's not such a huge um cost to to someone but yeah there should be something about the player has to like live in the country um i think it's also a good idea for them to have to like uh skip an olympiad so you can't just play like the next olympiad you have to skip one because i do feel like that's an important event and i think there should be some kind of i don't know waiting period or something for that um, but, uh, yeah. What do you guys think? Have your opinions changed at all today? Oh, Not mine. <laughs> unfortunately, we've just reified our own opinions here, Kosti. They've hardened. <laughs> They've hardened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's a really tough, again, it's a really tough balance because we're, you know, we're talking about players who, let's say in the worst cases are just like purely bought versus players who, are like fleeing their country and it's like right now it's like the same rules apply to both which is mm-hmm. which is a bit strange i was also thinking i didn't mention this but you know maybe there should be some kind of committee right there's not that many 2700 switching maybe it should be a case by case basis like is this a fair like are they actually moving or is this um you know not really not really necessary that they have to switch like in Farouja's mm-hmm. case i would say it was necessary right absolutely necessary for for others maybe not so much if you want to see corruption in action, give Fide like. Yeah, committee. I know, I know. <laughs> give him a committee. 
<laughs> I thought Costi had a good idea until you said that, Jesse. <laughs> I mean, because he's right that it's like rare enough that you could evaluate them on a case by case basis if you could trust the people evaluating, I guess. But you just can't. No, just as right. far as those compensation <laughs> fees, also, like I would, I'm will, I don't know many details on this, but I would bet very, very strongly bet that Armenia has given more than 50,000 euros to Aronian over the last 15 years. So like, I would bet that they're like losing tons of money on this like compensatory fee. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, no question. Um, it's good to know that the difference between a 2,600 and a 2,700 is about 20,000 euros. I would have right. thought it's a lot higher. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, you should definitely save up for 2700s and not blow any of your money on 2600s at those <laughs> prices. Um, okay, guys, any any final thoughts? No, no. I, I guess I'll just say I don't think people are being bought in the way that the conspiracy hive out there thinks they're being bought, <laughs> but we've kind of been through that, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, well, then, guys, that's going to do it. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, and uh, listening to uh, to the podcast, if that's where you are. Um, that's going to do it for this show. So take care. We'll see you all next time. Bye.